everybody. Welcome to this next session of the Open Government Week organized by the City Council of Madrid. It's for us a privilege and a honor to have uh, Silvia Saavedra with us. Uh, from our point of view, she's going to introduce this interdisciplinarity, co-design and participation, key elements for, manage, for, manage, for management, managing cities in the 21st century. And in this sense, it's a pleasure to be able to analyze this um, debate of good practices in the field of local participation. In this sense, we've got uh, Silvia Saavedra, uh, it's a privilege to have it. Uh, she will contextualize this session. And we are fortunate to have a key person in the process of modernization and participation in Madrid City Council. Welcome, Silvia Salvedra, for uh, coming to this session. Thank you, Marta. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, me to apologize to this small schedule change. I was supposed to close the open government week, but I have to advance my intervention due to an urgent matter. Sometimes uh, things do not turn out absolutely perfect, which they, but uh, I'll get straight to the point. Um, I want to thank uh, all the speakers for participating in this event during these three intense days. It has been, it's, it has been a real honor for Madrid to host these workshops and to be able to share with you some of the challenges we have on our plate. Furthermore, congratulations on the level and quality of the presentation. I truly believe we have an excellent range of speakers and issues. We are also very grateful to all the cities that make the participatory group possible because only by working together, we can improve and have better outcomes Madrid is concerned to connect with other cities committed with the goals of open government and participative approaches around the world. Basically, that's the reason we have launched this community of practice. After all, Madrid City, Hall, uh, Madrid City Hall Council is a strongly and deeply dedicated to accountability, responsibility, and of course, participation. Indeed, we are looking forward to keep progressing with everyone's collaboration. And we are proud of the, all the initiatives we've seen, both national and international, and proud of uh, what has been achieved here. Those results certainly encourage us to continue working hard in order to achieve an effective democratic governance. To make that goal possible, we have a long way to walk, and along the path, we must achieve three objectives. First, accessibility. We must be inclusive. We have to reach everybody to reduce as far as possible the digital divide. Second, we must work hard to avoid money measures we send with political biases, the way in which we'll communicate by neutral and impartial. Third, closely related to the previous point, we must prevent people from getting frustrated and losing their illusions and the links they have with the administration. Just three steps, just a piece of cake, yes. But seriously, citizen participation, citizen involvement is still a big challenge in the 21st century, which means that we have to adopt a much more active role in our society in our time. In fact, it's a part of our duty, it's our responsibility. And I can assure you that in Madrid, we take what citizens have to tell us very seriously because we listen to them to understand what their real needs are. And we give shape to that, giving the opportunity to participate through all the phases of uh, public policies. Therefore, we believe that the successful transformation that I, uh, I've been talking about begins by involving as many people as possible. So that's a clue, that's a core, that's a central idea of our slogan. Si participas, decides Madrid. Something like, if you participate, you decide Madrid 21st. 
Finally, allow me to say goodbye. Almost I, I started appreciating that you have accompanied us in the Open Government Week and thanking you once again because you have been very generous sharing your proposals and your experience to us and with us. So thank you very much. And the most important of, of all, keep in touch. Muchas gracias. Thanks so much, Silvia, for your nice and deep words. Uh, it's a privilege to have uh, the introduction of this uh, five, five uh, panel that we are going to, to have during uh, this morning. Listening to you and making the introduction of this uh, panel, uh, the idea was to, <coughs> to recap and to join people from the five continents that are working and working very hard in experiences of public participation. We have joined people coming from the academia, coming from NGOs and from different scopes, not only urbanism and cities, but only technological and scoping the digitalization of our society. We are living in a society, in a global society, where we can receive just uh, looking for looking at the news, uh, looking at the social media, that there's a um, there's a weak uh, legitimacy of democracies. There's something weak on democracies, and we think that public participation is filling or, or is starting to fill the gap uh, between society, NGOs, academia, and citizens and a government. So we really seek for uh, looking all the practices and all the experiences that are contributing to fill this gap and to make citizens being part of these democracy systems. So now uh, Antonio Lopez uh, will introduce our first panelist and thank you so much uh, to everybody that is coming uh, to this panel all of us are good friends also. And the first desire that we have is that the next uh, Open Government Week will be, uh, will be present. And we will share not only Zoom screens, but also experiences and good lunch and, and all the atmosphere uh, that makes, I think that makes human be beings, not only mm, digital uh, connections. So thanks so much to everybody. And I, and I give the word to my dear friend, Antonio Lopez. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Welcome, everybody. OK, thank you, Marta. I'll, I think that from our point of view, uh, in this seminar, no, inter interdisciplinarity, co-design, participation are key elements for managing cities in the 21st century. From my point of view, there is no democracy without participation. There is not a, the inclusive city without a participation. And in this sense, it is a pleasure to be able to analyze and debate with practices in the field of local participation. Um, Anthony, our first speaker, has a very strong background in the field of public participation as a founder member of democratic society, an NGO focuses on the strength of democracy. And in this sense, it's a perfect, uh, perfect speaker for us today. And we, we are very happy to, to count on you in, and your commitment to our project. Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Antonio. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. So um, a, a few words of introduction, so you understand where I'm starting from. Um, as Antonio says, I was one of the founders of the organization I still run called the Democratic Society 15 years ago. Um, but before that, I also had 14 years in government, uh, working in the Ministry of Finances and the uh, Cabinet Office in the UK and also for a local government. So I've got experience on both sides of the table. It's always fascinating for me to attend events in Open Government Week and other Open Government events because so much has changed since I was a civil servant in the 1990s and 2000s, but also so much is still the same. Some of the challenges around engaging citizens, 
different sorts of conversations perhaps, but still some of the really critical issues around how do our places develop? How do our cities flourish? How do, how do we reach the people in the communities who are farthest away from politics, farthest away from participation? And for me, some of the work that's been going on in Madrid uh, is, a, is a fantastic example. And I'm really pleased to be able to be with you to share some of my thoughts. I want to, to focus my remarks really on how the NGOs sector, how civil society like my organization can support participation in cities particularly around the issue of climate change. So climate change is on the same, at the same time an enormous issue. It is global, uh, it's discussed in the European Council, it's discussed at the United Nations, but it's also extremely local and extremely personal. It is perhaps the most personal global issue because the actions that are taken by, uh, to combat climate change are the actions of you and me in our individual lives, but they're also the actions of local and regional authorities who are making decisions about uh, mobility systems, about transport, around industry and around the housing stock that are having huge effects on climate change, but also huge effects on people's lives. I think we all see that these decisions can only be taken along with citizens, but that's not just a question of asking them on a single day what they think and then doing a 10 year plan on the back of it. It's about involving them all the way through the process. And the way uh, the remarks I want to share draw on our experience, both from the Citizens Assembly in Scotland on climate change, for which we were one of the lead design partners, but also for a, a programme of work that we have going on with 15 cities across Europe, including Madrid, on supporting climate change and participation in city governments. And the things that the things that we've learned from there about the role of NGOs is that civil society structures are absolutely essential if you're going to build the long-term participation that some of these decisions need. Civil society structures can make a, make a, a starting point uh, for conversations. They can bring people together in trusted environments. They can ensure that people are seeing other people like them in the conversation but also they can reach out into communities, both geographical communities and communities of background that are not accessible to city governments directly. And in particular, you know, they can support the person-to-person uh, -person relationships and the word of mouth connections that make people trust democratic processes and trust participative events. That's not something that you can do straight away. You can't, you can't start it today and do it tomorrow. It involves a lot of on the ground work, a lot of relationship building, a lot of community building and a lot of support. And organisations like mine, which specialise in the design and running of these creative democratic spaces, really depend on there being a strong civil society infrastructure to connect to. And similarly, we depend on a strong government institution to connect to, because a lot of these processes are making the connection between government and citizens. And like any good connection, you need both sides of that relationship to work. You need citizens who are ready to participate. You need citizens who are able to step into the conversation and feel that they are able to have a voice. And those citizens need to be from broad representative audiences. But also you need government officials and politicians who are willing to listen to those uh, to listen to those views and who have the skills to structure participation into their decision making processes because if there's one thing that we know from our work over the last 15 years is that it is that representation and participation are not alternative forms of democracy they are complementary forms of democracy and to work well together you need to have politicians and political systems that understand how they can be brought together and understand how citizen voice can be used to strengthen the, the position of representative, uh, representative democracy and representative governments. So citizens assemblies, to go into a little bit more detail on my experiences uh, in Scotland and elsewhere, are a really good way of doing that. Uh, for those of you who've not experienced them or aren't quite sure what the term means, uh, they generally are um, 50 to 100, sometimes even 200 people uh, brought together on a representative basis. So when we say representative, 
we don't usually mean that it's mathematically representative because if you think about yeah a group of 100 people anyone or any any group or sector of society that's fewer than one percent won't see themselves represented in that room so we try in constructing these processes to build in diversity uh, so that everybody can see themselves in the room so that's about diversity of background diversity of geography diversity of education and also diversity of attitude so it's quite important if you're dealing with a, a, a you know, difficult political process that your diversity includes people who've had all sorts of different opinions on the on that uh, on that issue who come from a wide range of perspectives because the purpose and the value of citizen assemblies is to take some of the most difficult issues and the hardest trade-offs and ensure that people can understand and uh, deliberate on the issues in question and if you do that with everybody on one side of the debate and no one on the other side of the debate then you're not getting into a good process so in the context of climate change and in the context of the Scotland work we started from the perspective that climate change was real and was a challenge and that it needed action to be taken so this wasn't a you know should there should should we do something or should we not it was a what should we do citizen assembly and in that context it was a, it was important to to uh, to show forth and to set out all of the different sorts of decisions that could be taken and all of the different angles that climate change brings about and that's not just about the technical uh, should we have solar power or wind power uh, or should we retrofit homes first or factories first but also some of the questions around just transition around ensuring that as climate change action is taken we are not further disadvantaging those people who are already disadvantaged and we are not further excluding those people who are already excluded so making climate change a just transition is something where citizen assemblies are really important but diversity in those voices is also really important um, so in the in the scotland process we spent several weekends uh, each weekend had a different topic we worked with citizens through some of the questions and at the end they came out with a set of recommendations for the scottish government now the scottish government is not required to take every single one of those recommendations on board that's not how citizens assemblies generally work um, but of course they have given them very serious consideration they are looking at them now there's just been an election so the new government in scotland will be taking those recommendations on certainly i would be surprised if the vast majority of those recommendations don't get implemented more or less as they were written by citizens but as i said before climate change is a long-term process and uh, for me a citizens assembly is only really the start which is one of the reasons why i'm really pleased that in scotland and in our other work in cities a lot of the work that has been started with a citizens assembly process is being continued with a program of engagement that uses the citizens assembly as a starting point so in scotland there is a continuing conversation using the members of the citizens assembly as advocates and ambassadors and also ensuring that they can stay involved as the ideas that they came up with move towards implementation we've seen the same in france where the uh, citizens convention on, on climate change had a group of members who've been taken forward through the process as that as those recommendations which i think are about uh, eight nine months old now are being turned into legislation or are some in some cases not being taken forward so there's an opportunity for, for them to demand explanations to ask the government to to set out its reasoning uh, and and that kind of constructive positive challenge over the long term is really important and the reason it's important is that because the decisions that climate change brings about are so long term we don't need we, we mustn't get ourselves into a situation where we are appealing back to a conversation from five or ten years ago as the reason that we are doing something that is disrupting people's lives right now uh, we all know and we've all seen across europe that there is a there, is, there are a group of politicians a group of a group of activists who are more than happy uh, to blame a distant elite or to blame scientists or to blame you know some some very remote bad guy figure uh, for the difficult decisions that politicians need to take and for me part of the rationale for participation and part of the rationale for long-term participation is that we need to uh, prevent that argument from running we need to prevent an argument that says our distant remote people are taking decisions that affect your lives because to be totally honest right now 
distant remote people are taking a lot of decisions that affect our lives. And for me, participation is about closing that gap and reducing the, the sense of disempowerment and the sense of, of alienation that some people feel from the political processes that are governing them. Sometimes I should add political processes that are, that are happening in companies as much as are happening in democratically representative governments. So creating those spaces and creating those, those, those middle areas where people can come together, where governments and citizens can come together is a critical role for NGOs. But I think it's also fair to say that we are learning how to do this as we go. There is, there is no, one in the, no one in Europe, no one in the world who can say convincingly, this is the absolute proven way to make these processes work. Because you know, we've been going 15 years as an organization and really we were founded at the very start of some of these movements in the, in the in 19, you know, 1990s were some of the very early experiments. And as things have moved and grown in scale, you know, we are all learning as we go along. And one of the things that we are finding as we expand, as this area expands, is that the skills that we need in government around how to commission, how to support these kinds of initiatives, and the skills that we need among uh, the public and in civil society organizations about how to facilitate democratic participation, how to make uh, you know, how to make events run well, how to ensure that you're including people actively rather than just having them in the room staying silent. You know, all of these skills are, are not very widespread and there is definitely a need for longer term support for the kinds of institutions and the kinds of training methods that will allow these skills to grow in existing community organizations, in existing governments, and also in the new forms of institutions that are starting to grow up around participation and around engagement. I also think that as we get into more serious issues and as these processes are taken more seriously, we will see the same kind of lobbying and influence operations that have happened around traditional political processes happen around citizen-led political processes. And the robustness and the and the rigor with which these these events are run and the independence that they need to have is absolutely critical. So for me, it's really important that as we take some of these conversations forward and as we we think about how this world is developing and how citizens assemblies and other democratic processes can be used for these kinds of for this kind of work, I think it's really important that we we are quite self-critical and that we look at ourselves as organizations, whether in government or in civil society, and say, what are we doing to make these processes absolutely authoritative, absolutely trustworthy, and absolutely honest? Because if we aren't able to make those things clear, then the public will not trust us, you know, because there is a lot of skepticism, there's a lot of cynicism even about politics with a capital P and about political processes with a small p. And for us, this is a, this is a critical issue of trust on both sides. We need the decision makers to trust the processes that we create, but we also need citizens to trust that their involvement will be useful and that the time that they are giving up in their busy lives when they have a million other things to do is going to be a real contribution to the well-being of their cities and their communities and their families. So to try and to try and sum up a little bit what I'm what I'm saying, there's definitely an enormous role for NGOs uh, to work constructively and productively with cities like Madrid and with cities across the world to create conversations about climate change. But I don't want you to think it's an easy one-off thing. It's about a commitment to change and a commitment to development and training in staff. It's about creating and supporting these spaces over the long term so that you can build up trusting relationships with citizens and that they can understand the processes that are going on. And it's about ensuring that the methods that are used and the information that is given is transparent, is accountable, and that the processes themselves are robust and are, are able to stand up to lobbying or attempts to subvert them or attempts to influence them unduly. If we can make that work, then I do believe we are able to construct around climate change, but also around a lot of other issues, a much more constructive, co-creative conversation where citizens and, uh, and governments and other decision makers can work together to design some of the outcomes that we want to see. And that the level of distrust and hostility that we are occasionally seeing between citizens and government institutions can be reduced. Uh, the outcome of which I hope will be a much more productive, a much more uh, conversational relationship between citizens and government. And I think that's something that I certainly hope for 
and I hope uh, we would all hope for. So uh, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I'm really looking forward to the contributions of others who are coming from all sorts of all sorts of other angles on this, and naturally really looking forward as well to the questions and the discussions. Uh, and me and my my colleague Juan, who's who's our Democratic Society's uh, officer in Madrid, will be more than happy to pick up a conversation afterwards if there's anything people want to go further on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much. I think that now Marta is is the time for. Uh, the following speaker, no? no? Marta, we can hear you. We can hear you. You have to open your microphone. Yeah, pardon okay. me. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Anthony, for your for your some for your summary and your synthesis of a global problem. And I have the pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Camille Miel uh, Mialot that will uh, make a very complementary uh, um, presentation of uh, climate change issues. He's, uh, uh, Camille Mialot, Mialot, he's my uh, sole uh, partner in his thesis doctorate because we make uh, uh, we make a thesis in the contrary way. He, he came to, to Spain to make his thesis and I went to France to make my thesis in a comparative uh, point of view. But most of all, uh, he's a lawyer specialized in land use law, in expropriations, but he's also a professor in, in Sciences Po in, in Paris. So he's got the practical point of view and the intellectual point of view of reality. He just uh, he has just published a very very good uh, book that I recommend you. The name is La Ville face au changement, changement climatique. So he's going to speak a little bit about uh, the problem of, of climate change through and how public participation uh, can achieve or can contribute to um, the fight against uh, climate change. Thanks so much, uh, Camille for coming to this Open Government Week and for the effort uh, to speak, uh, summarizing your contributions on your book. Thanks so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marta. I'm very glad to be here um, to speak in English. Uh, <laughs> as I speak quite fluently Spanish, uh, I would say a few words in Spanish uh, para agradecer a todos los que Eh, están involucrados en, en este Decides Madrid, eh, primero a la eh, vicealcaldía y a la vicealcaldesa, y a Marta, por supuesto, a Antonio, eh, a Silvia Saavedra, eh, que habló primera. Eh, eh, bueno, tengo un vínculo muy personal con Madrid, muy antiguo, de más de 20 años, y bueno, es un, realmente un placer. Now I speak in English. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a very bad accent. I'm sure the translator is going to fail. <laughs> but I'm going to try to explain you um, the French Convention, uh, Citizen Convention on Climate, uh, a very innovative experience, uh, very new. Uh, new because it's at the state level. Uh, it's a national, was a national convention. Um, well, I'm going to share a PowerPoint. Uh, it's easier for me to explain it to you uh, with a PowerPoint. Okay, I'm trying to share it. Uh, you, do you see it? It's okay. Do you see it online? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah, it's okay. I, no, I can see, I, I cannot see the, the PowerPoint. I only can see you. Uh, well, don't say me that it's working, but uh, you don't see it. Wow. Now. Right now. now. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Perfect. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, the French Citizen Convention on Climate. Uh, why? Uh, did I want to speak about that experience, very new experience, is that uh, in a way, uh, 
it didn't work very well. But as it is new, it's very interesting to study uh, the way uh, it worked or not. Um, so this is the convention. And now the Citizens Convention on Climate Change was set up in France uh, in response to the movement of the Yellow Vests. You, everybody knows the Yellow Vest, the French Yellow Vest movement. And in response to this movement, uh, the president of the French Republic um, in April 2019 uh, decided to um, set up uh, this citizen convention with a very large, very wide scope of intervention uh, because this convention, the aim was to formulate of the necessary legislative, constitutional and administrative measures to reduce greenhouse gas emission of at least 40% in less than 10 years in 2030. So, 30, um, and the, the, the most important thing was to propose all these measures uh, while ensuring social justice. And why did the president, uh, the French president, uh, want to focus on social justice? This, this is very important. Uh, because at the root of the uh, Yellow Vest movement, there is a, a, a very important climate injustice. Uh, uh, climate injustice in the sense that uh, this is the decision of the government in 2018 uh, to increase uh, the carbon tax that provoke uh, in response to the Yellow Vest movement. And of course, the increase of uh, tax, uh, uh, the carbon tax on fuel uh, was uh, decisive, very important for a part of the population, part of the population uh, who lives uh, in the suburbs or in little towns. And uh, the principal, the main uh, way of transportation is, of course, car. So um, this increase of carbon tax have, uh, had a very, very bad impact on their life and on their daily life. Uh, so social justice was at the core. The idea uh, to set up the, the, this convention was new, of course, but, uh, and this is a topic uh, Anthony just talked about, uh, the, the problem was representativeness. Uh, the Yellow Vest movement revealed a, a big gap between the government and people in France. And a large part of people living their daily life with cars and fuel and so on. But the main problem to solve while setting up this convention was how to ensure representativeness. Uh, this is a big problem. Uh, the solution we, we, we found in France was uh, a mathematical representativeness. Uh, it was decided to roll out for 150 citizens and uh, completely representative of the French population. And a private body, um, a Paul Institute, Louis Harris, was involved in this um, process. Uh, of drawing lots of 150 people. To be precise, what they did uh, is um, to generate uh, 3,000, 300,000 um, telephone numbers uh, and to contact 300,000 people uh, and to ask them if they wanted to be involved in this uh, convention. Uh, quite innovative uh, mathematical uh, process. And um, the aim was to, to be completely representative of people, of the people of France. 
So there were some criteria here. You have a, a picture, uh, an extract from the website of the uh, French Convention on, on Climate. And um, for instance, gender was a criteria. And in accordance with the reality of a French society, the convention was made up of 51% of women. Uh, the age, another criteria, uh, the age group was divided in six and proportional to the age pyramid. Uh, the younger uh, member of the convention uh, was 16 years old. Um, as well, another criteria was the level of qualification and uh, six levels uh, had been selected uh, from uh, upper, I would say, uh, society and to uh, people uh, living in extreme poverty. Um, another criteria was uh, the diversity uh, in territories. So um, all people from all parts of France, including overseas uh, territories were selected. The, the idea of representativeness was very important and was central uh, in this process. Uh, in order um, to uh, guarantee the independence of the convention, uh, a governance uh, committee was set up. Uh, as Anthony said, uh, this is a very important point uh, to guarantee the independence of the body of the convention. Uh, and um, there is a um, government committee uh, co-chaired by two persons um, very known, very well known and famous in France and abroad. Uh, first, Laurence Toubiana. Um, who is president of the Foundation for Climate. Um, Laurence Tubiana uh, had a very important role uh, in the Paris Agreement. And uh, another person, the second person, the second director or president of this uh, independent committee was Thierry Pesch, uh, director of the Foundation Terra Nova, well known as well. And the government committee was also composed of uh, experts, uh, climate experts, of course, but also economics experts, um, experts on public participation uh, and social matters and so on. Um, and we may say that the convention, I mean, 150 members uh, selected uh, to be representative, and the governance committee worked quite well. Before the start of this convention, uh, the president of the Republic made a personal commitment, very important, uh, that raised many constitutional problems. It uh, was to uh, present all the measures decided by uh, the convention without filter to the parliament. It means that it was more or less um, a way to abandon uh, the uh, executive powers, uh, the administrative powers. And that was a very important concession to the uh, convention. Uh, of course, at the end, uh, the president really could not <laughs> could not present of all the measures to the parliament without filter uh, it was it was constitutionally impossible um, the risk was uh, to uh, invalid the, the, the bill um, but more or less an important part of the measures uh, proposed uh, were presented to the parliament A few words about uh, the process. Uh, Anthony said that uh, it's a long-term process, participation. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, for this punctual participation, we may say it lasts more or less one year. 
Well, it began in 2019, uh, in October, and, and in April uh, 2020, with seven sessions. Uh, you have here all the sessions. It's in English because there is a, a version of, uh, um, of the website of the convention, an English version, so, so you can go there and add this um, session, all those sessions, the description of the session. I may say that part of the first sessions was to uh, inform, uh, educate um, people about climate. This is very important. Uh, a lot of climate experts went to the convention and explained the problem. Um, the first step of the information was very important. And then began the process of formulating uh, the possible measures. At the end, uh, session seven, um, the uh, convention, all the citizens form, they formulated a report with measures, a very detailed report of more than 500 pages. Um, all the proposals were um, regrouped, or, yeah, we may say regrouped, in five topics, to consume, to produce and work, transportation, mobilities, housing, and food. What we see is what more or less uh, told Anthony, uh, that climate change is going to impact uh, our daily life in all uh, its dimension. And all those dimensions to consume, to produce and work uh, are impacted and it's quite a good way to present what is going to change in our life and what could be the measures uh, to go uh, to the re reduce uh, of 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. You can go uh, to the website and uh, have a look at the report. There is a summary in English, uh, but I'm going to, to, to quote some of the proposals. For instance, um, in the topic housing and the fight, uh, fight against uh, artificialization of land, one of the proposals is to define a restrictive envelope of the maximum number of hectares that can be artificially artificialized, sorry for the very bad accent, reducing by two uh, the artificialization of land. Wow, this is an interesting proposal that is now uh, being in discussion uh, in the parliament, in the French parliament. But if you put it in its wider context, uh, and when you know that France, for instance, uh, consume uh, per habitant 50% uh, more than uh, uh, the other uh, European countries, then you notice that to reduce by two is not a big step. Hmm? It's quite reasonable, too much reasonable, perhaps. Uh, Another topic, uh, another example of proposal uh, in the topic transportation mobilities uh, was to reduce uh, on the motorway uh, the speed to uh, 110 kilometers per hour as a maximum. And now it's 130 kilometers per hour. This proposal was not a revolution. It's quite, uh, I may say, um, reasonable again. Um, but the government decided to, to amend it and not to keep this proposal. Uh, um, well, I will give you then what happened. What happened with all those proposals that are more or less like, I would say, a list of proposals, a patchwork of proposals. There is no, I would say, they are regrouped, of course, in topic, in the five topics I told you, but it's the main impression that it is a patchwork of proposals uh, without a global coherence. Uh, 
But the proposals were taken up by the government. There, the constitutional process uh, followed uh, normally, I would say, and uh, the proposals um, were amended, of course, by the government and then by the parliament. And as a result, of course, the many changes uh, of the proposals uh, resulting from the process uh, were understood by the members uh, as a confiscation of the power, of the power uh, to propose and to elaborate law in a way. And uh, in, a, in a way as a betrayal of the work. And it was not, um, it was not in the process, but there have been an eight session that was not uh, planned. And uh, in this last session, uh, after the report, uh, the convention decided to um, criticize uh, the government uh, um, um, way of acting. And it's of course, an expression of their independence, uh, but it, to me, uh, to my mind, uh, it reveals the frustration. Of course, you gave them the power to make law and then you quit, quit it. It's a frustration, a big frustration. So my opinion, my general opinion of the French Citizen Convention uh, on climate, First, it's really innovative, very, really interesting. Sure, surely. It's a good way to inform people uh, about climate, um, climate problems, climate matters, climate issues. And it is interesting in that way. To my mind, the problem is that being a convention at the state level, uh, the scope was too large. I'm sure the scope was, was very large. Uh, all the measures, constitutional measures, uh, legislative and administrative measures, um, it means a very, very wide scope, too large to me. Uh, that's why there is no currency, uh, currents uh, between all, all the proposals. Um, in a way, the process, even if it's innovative, interesting, uh, important, necessary, I would say, was frustrating for all parties. I mean, for, for, frustrating for uh, people involved in the convention, frustrating for the government, uh, of course, uh, frustrating for the parliament, and at the end, uh, a little frustrating for all the people um, uh, fighting uh, against climate change, and I would say um, all the people involved uh, in the, all those matters. Um, because of course, one of the effects of this convention uh, is to me, um, is that people involved in those processes are not, are not willing to uh, abandon, I may say, uh, the actual, the daily way of life. Um, I mean, one of the goal, one of the impact of climate change of, uh, on our way of living, as Anthony said, is a complete change. I mean, uh, we don't know yet how we are going to live in 10 years and less how we are going to live in 30 years. Um, and um, it's very difficult, it's a very important responsibility to ask people um, to imagine uh, their future. And um, I think it's very important to involve people, but you can't rely only on people, ideas, knowledge uh, uh, to propose, uh, to suggest, uh, or including to force uh, some uh, change, important change in our daily life. For instance, I will take 
uh, a final example um, when we are talking about cores, cores, cores is part of our life of our cities, cities construction. Um, and of course, uh, we are going to, I won't say to abandon cores, but uh, the way we use it today um, is daily. And I mean, in 30 years, probably, uh, if we have core, course, uh, we will use it once a week or for holidays, and we won't be we won't earn cores, but we will we are going to rent cores to go on holidays. Uh, it's a complete different world we are going uh, to to live in, and I think it's very difficult to imagine this future and to um, to to put this responsibility of uh, citizens is perhaps in a way too heavy. And well, that's what the main crit critic I have to, uh, to formulate uh, uh, towards uh, this experience. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for hearing me. I hope that my accent was not too bad. Gracias a todos y a todas por escucharme. Y bueno, quedo abierto a sus preguntas. Um, Keep open to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think that, uh, as Marta said, we have a round table at the end of the of the of the conferences now. And okay. Okay, and I, and I think that after this amazing presentation, I think that we have a new speaker with us. No? In the field of participation, the super diversity of our societies must be taken into account. No? And also the diversity between countries. Participation strengthens social networks ties between citizens and ties between citizens and the administration. And in this sense, right now we are fortunate to have in this seminar the participation of Luis Perea, full professor of architecture and expert in urban planning in developing countries, especially Sierra Leone. Uh, Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you, uh, Antonio. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, to the organization for inviting me. It is an honor uh, to present this experience in Sierra Leone. I'm going to share the, the screen. Just a second, please. Can, can you see the, the screen? Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, okay, well, uh, this is an experience based on universities. Uh, well, this is the location of Sierra Leone. Here is the country, close to 8 uh, million people. And here is McKinney, the, the city where we are, have been working for several years in this uh, joint experience. Well, one of the key reasons of this project is the big gap we can find the, between countries. And here comparing, well, Spain with Sierra Leone, we can find one of the, of the most uh, motivating reasons of, 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 of this experience in trying to reduce this huge gap between countries. So following the questions of the, that the organization gave us, this was the first one. The domain is the inter-university development cooperation. So, well, this is a summary slide of our project. Just to understand, here we have the University of McKinney in Sierra Leone, Teo San Pablo University in Madrid, where I am teaching urban planning. We started in 2009, we are still working there, and we organized our collaboration 
with the University of McKinney in four key fields, architecture and urban planning development, economics, humanities and communication, health. We have an interdisciplinary unit, Habitability and Development Laboratory, uh, and we work through this sequence of concepts, training, research, participation, and action. Focus on architecture, we have partners here in Madrid, different universities, institutions, also in McKinney, with the city council, local communities, schools, and other institutions, uh, well, to work in different, in different fields. Also, the second question was to explain briefly uh, the experience. I'm going to do it right now very quickly. Uh, well, we have in, now we are focused on architecture, urban planning. We have four key fields of action. The McKinney city, the neighborhoods or villages, the University of McKinney, and what we call social actions. So in each one, we will find different scales of participation. And I think that this is something very interesting. How can we connect different scales and areas of uh, public participation? In the McKinney City scale, well, we started with an urban planning process in July 2013, involving the key stakeholders of the city, uh, supported by the McKinney City Council, but of course, with the civil society associations, uh, regional departments. And here, the, the main goal was to detect the main priorities of the, of the city, organized in five thematic areas. January 2014, we come back uh, with the first ideas to open the discussion. She is the mayor of, of McKinney, Sunkari Kawakamara, and it's also important as Anthony mentioned the, the importance of the of the politicians in supporting these processes. And this is something that happened here, and this was really key. Also, we have been mapping the city little by little, the land uses around of the territory. We come back in well after the sorry. Just after the Ebola crisis uh, in January 2016 with a model here in the bottom right, you can see a model of the city that was a tool for the interaction with the participants in, in new workshops. This is something key for all the people to understand better the, the place, the site, the territory. Also, well, the mayor of McKinney and the vice chancellor of the University of McKinney have been here in, in Madrid just to continue the process and keeping uh, interaction together. Another steps, 2017, discuss, discussions about the possible ring road around the city. And the last step in this first field was a workshop in 2019 to evaluate priorities. And here we use a map for all the participants to interact and also to identify the location of their priorities. In our university, Teo San Pablo, we have been involving the students also. This is a final project of one student focused on Sierra Leone here in the city of McKinney and was another tool for opening the discussion in urban planning uh, there. The second scale, very interesting, neighborhood and villages is focused on working with the local communities. Here, we organize groups to map the area, to collect data, key data, and also to support a small action that the community finally decide. And just as an, as an example, here in Makenkita village, the decision of the community was to build a new community center. And with just 1,000 euros, it, it was possible, of course, with the participation of the, the community, the villagers, uh, building the mud bricks, and also during the construction process. In the third level, of course, the University of McKinney is part of all the different actions, but uh, we have a specific projects with them in terms of academic issues, urban planning courses, but also, uh, well, supporting new infrastructures of, of, of their campus. For example, this was 
a building designed by students, lecturers, and external collaborators of our university. It's a guest house for the Fatima campus of the university. Funded by the NGO Manos Unidas, this is another building that was also designed with students, lecturers, collaborators in the other campus of the university. And finally, to conclude, the field of social action that is focused on schools, so different levels of the participation. And here we work close with, 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 the, with the schools of the city in terms of improving wash, water sanitation and hygiene, uh, well, developing workshops and designing furniture. Here also providing materials. But look, this was interesting. Here the topic of this workshop was draw your neighborhood in the San Francis Secondary School. And this is another way of interacting with here with the students of this school, understanding what they how they present their families, their neighborhoods, their houses. And it's also a way of getting information about the place. And the last action I am going to present is a pilot project, a well latrine, it's a, a small improvement in the basic solutions they have. We designed and implemented and constructed in one of the schools. And this project has been scaled up by Manos Unidas for three schools. Now we are working in this project with Caritas McKenney, that is the local counterpart, and also with the CHAP postgraduate course. They are helping us with the graphical and technical information. So just to finish, and following the questions that Marta sent us, uh, the five uh, positive views I consider that could be replicated or that we found interesting in this experience is the universities as promoters of actions that can ensure the, the, the projects on time. Well, the long-term approach that has been mentioned in the previous, the, uh, the previous speakers, uh, well, we started um, close to more than 10 years ago. So this is key. We are friends now and we keep working together with, with, with a mutual trust. Well, the connection between theory and research and action and implementing real actions. The involvement of different stakeholders and different scales, as I have uh, presented. And well, finally, the multidisciplinary approach. Summarizing uh, this one word, it was another <laughs> last question, maybe co cooperation could be. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you very much for your insightful conference. And now, Marta, we have another speaker, no? Yes, uh, we are. Um, I was looking if uh, Rebecca Lesimski has from Australia is already connected, but I don't see here on the wave. So perhaps we, uh, if we wait for her connection, Mm, I would like to recap a little bit be before the introduction that we are going to make of Rebecca, of these three uh, vibrant presentations that you that we have done, and what if we have uh, some questions from the chat? Just making a brief, uh, a brief uh, parenthesis in 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 this panel. What we've seen, and from all the notes that I am writing on, is that. Uh, all these processes are, are based, as Anthony has told us, in trust and the necessity of uh, connection and the complementary of public and private organizations, institutions, and the need. And I think that uh, Camille has shown us very well with all the procedure of the convention in France, uh, how quick and very step uh, procedures are required. And even though all these procedures are fa and phases are step by step, they create in some cases frustration. So I think the big challenge, and perhaps we can comment uh, before uh, Rebecca can connect, 
we we can give you the word uh, to the to the panelists and perhaps Antonio also want to comment a little bit. Um, how can we um, fight? And, and I think uh, one of the of the big issues and challenges uh, challenges that we have in public participation is to have all these ex comparative experiences. I think making this kind of forums, uh, making the comparison with uh, the different experiences, the frustration, uh, how frustration has worked in, in a process, how trust in public participation has worked in another, how the different scales of territorial approach has worked it's very, very important because sometimes I think Ian, it's one of the perhaps defects that we have in these processes is that uh, we think uh, when we get involved in a public participation process that our participation process is brand new, it's unique and it is an our participation process is the real one. I mean, pardon me for the expression, it's the good one. And the rest of them, okay, they are quite okay, but they don't function as mine. And this is not true. So we need a little bit of uh, humble, being a little bit humble and trying to connect and reconnect uh, with all these comparative experiences before, not afterwards, because we've got a lot of, lot of studies of um, of the study of the all uh, uh, the already done public participation process, and perhaps it would be better to do this study before starting this uh, uh, starting each 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 process. So I give uh, before I don't know if Rebecca is already connected, uh, if she's, but we've got uh, Juan Felipe connected, and perhaps uh, Juan Felipe. If you are ready, uh, we could change the order, and because uh, Rebecca uh, had a uh, had a class, and we can start with Juan Felipe if you are ready, and if you don't mind, and I'm gonna make the introduction of uh, Juan Felipe uh, Pinilla Pineda. Uh, he's an urban lawyer. He's a PhD and professor of the University of uh, Los Andes. Um, He's specialized in urban planning, but also in the last years, he's been uh, participation directly in the pro in, in conflict resolution through public participation. Uh, he's, he's a very, very uh, good um, conciliator of, 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 uh, of different points of view. And he's a very, I think we are going to enjoy very much his exercise, his, presentation because he makes a very nice narrative of all the processes of public participation. So, uh, well, and, and, and I really want to thank uh, Juan Felipe uh, because now it's around uh, 5.30 or 6 a.m. in the morning in Colombia. So we really apologize for you for perhaps your errors in English or your mix, mix ups because we know it's quite early there. I know that you have drink a very good Colombian coffee, so we will you just warm up uh, in a little bit of time. But nevertheless, thanks very much for joining us and welcome. I give you the, the word. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Marta, for the introduction. And that's the problem that I couldn't have a coffee then. My brain <laughs> is not working well so far then but thank you very much for the for the introduction as i said I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about a case that i have been dealing with and in which i have been immersed for the last 10 years which is a project the Phoenicia project that which is an urban redevelopment project in a section of downtown bogota within the immediate vicinity of Los Andes University, the principal promoter of the project. The project has not be yet been completed, but the way in which it has been formulated, as well as its characteristics and basic objectives have made it a reference point in the city of Bogota. The project has been deemed an exemplary 
process of participative and community-based urban renewal project. The American Planning Association, the APA, granted the 2020 International Planning Excellence Award in the category of community and regional planning to the Fenicia project, just to give you an example of the, of the recognition of the process. Then what I have prepared here is a very brief uh, presentation about what I want to talk to you about, which is this, sorry, I, I go uh, backwards. And this is the, the title of a recent work that I have published, which is Governance Through Conflict, Consensus Building in the Urban Renewal Project, in the Phoenicia Urban Renewal Project in Bogot. Then what inspired me here is to talk to you about how conflict can uh, ease the way agreements, the way participation is uh, developed in a project. I think we don't have to avoid conflict, we have to manage conflict. And what I'm gonna talk to you is about that. Then let me give you a, a very brief location of the, of the project for, for those who uh, don't know. There in the, in the left, you have the location of Colombia in South America and where Bogota is located, right in the middle of the country. And to your right, you have the location of the project within Bogota. It's just some reference that the project is the project is located in downtown Bogota and uh, in the as I already mentioned in the vicinity of the Los Andes University its principal promoter this is now another picture of the area this area is almost nine hectares nine blocks and totally totally a consolidated area of the city that's the way it looks nowadays. There are a lot of parking lots. There are some big towers, which are not part of the project, but are right in the vicinity too. There are all construct constructions, parking, all constructions that some of them have turned into parking lots. Uh, and we have a very great diversity of socioeconomical backgrounds here. And this is like a microcosmos within the city because we have like everything uh, there. And I just wanted to give you a, a, a very brief like um, uh, images of the place where it takes place. Then I'm gonna talk to you, as I already mentioned, about a work. This, this work was recently published in a special issue of the journal Built Environment, which is very uh, connected to the session and to the proposal of the talk here. And it has to do with conflict, conflict and urban change. The issue aims to contribute to a better understanding of, of, of a better under, understanding of conflict as a potential force for urban transformation and to explore how citizens negotiate with institutions and institutions and vice versa. It has case studies from different places, United States, Belgium, France, and one in South America, Colombia specifically, and this is the case that is included in this uh, issue. And another, uh, another characteristic of this is that the editors of the special, uh, of this special uh, volume tries to propose a new methodology for learning from conflict, which they call a phenomenology of change approach. What can we understand about conflict and how can, how one can characterize conflict in different parts of the world as engines for change, for social change, and for spatial, spatial changes in, in territorial projects. Then what we did here was to try to combine 
three types of approaches. Let's say one, the variables that we study what the typologies of conflict that the project has faced during its implementation, the negotiation mechanisms that were used, and the changes it produced. From the point of view or from the role that different types of, of type of of stakeholders played. One, the promoter, the residents of the area, and the public officials. Based on that, and in, in different sources, we find that we can characterize this process as having different stages. The first, or the preliminary stage, as we call it, is what we said, what, what, what we characterize as shifting the business as usual approach. And we, I, I will explain that in, in some detail. And after we have a first stage that we call trust and building data collection. And after that, we have a negotiation amongst equals, which is a term that some of the community leaders uh, coined in their relation with the, with, the, with the promoter of the project. And we have then, a third stage, which is in, in which we are nowadays uh, in the project, the implementation of the agreements. Then I'm going to talk to you a, a little bit in detail about those stages. Let's see that. Then we have a preliminary stage, which is very important for this project. And the urban renewal process of the area had a, 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 a a background very important, which is a project called Manzana Cinco, Block Five project, which is an urban renewal project uh, that with the Fenicia project are the two main initiatives that have faced that part of, of the city. The, the Manzana Cinco or Block Five project was an official urban renewal project that was designed and launched by the city government in 2006 as part of a major renovation of plan for Bogota's downtown. Through the process, different types of conflict may, may be identified with that, in that case, but very few expressions of civil activism in that, in, that, in that time and in that case. In general terms, it is possible to determine that despite the fact that the Manzana 5 is nowadays commonly employed to symbolize coercive official displacement or eviction carried out for the purpose of speculation, little or not forms of civil resistance emerged at the time of the land acquisition phase. It was a project that was uh, implemented through a direct purchase and expropriation by the city, a whole block was uh, was intervened by the city to promote that project. We combined a uh, cultural facility with uh, a housing and commercial units uh, a, a building. As some ethnographic studies conducted in the area explain, during the process of expropriation and eviction, only a handful of the original residents resisted the process. And the owners who did, did so individually, mainly by employing judicial and bureaucratic means. The immediate, the, the immediate effects of the implementation of the Manzana Cinco, Man, Manzana Cinco project was a widespread rejection of state-driven state land management and, and of urban renewal in general. And as some scholars has documented, in the years following this case, there was a proliferation of newly formed grassroots organizations that were established to denounce the lack of protections for dealers in urban renewal projects. This case illustrates how the implementation of an urban renewal project developed according to a rational model of public policy will disregard the benefits of a consensus building strategy in favor, in favor of guaranteeing the achievement of the tangible results that we that that we want to present here in in the in the other case. Definitia project then is right neighbor of this 
of this process. And this project, the first, the first or the preliminary stage that we call shifting the business, the business as usual approach, uh, can be characterized uh, as this. The, the, the first part of the proposal of this project was conducted or initiated in 2007 by Los Andes University. And it responded to a poorly real estate logic driven almost exclusively by the expectations of the university. During those first years of examination and formulation of the proposal, no information had been provided to the neighboring community and consultation had been completely lacking. This shift from a traditional rational planning model towards a collaborative one can be explained by two, by two principal factors. In 2010, the university decided to shift the way it, it was dealing with the process formulation. Firstly, what, what can explain the shift? Firstly, that there was a growing level of rejection from local communities of urban renewal projects, as well as a widespread mistrust of the real estate developers and public institutions in charge of the promotion of this kind of projects. Of course, the unresolved social and political conflict inherited from the Manzana Cinco Block 5 project one of, was one of the main catalysts for civil unrest, for civic unrest. And it was an iconic case that highlighted the risks for local communities of a top-down urban renewal project. Secondly, the fact that the design and promotion of the Fenicia project was the work of a university rather than a real estate developer might also help explain the shift in the planning model used. Not only did the university have a different kind of interest in urban development that was not exclusively focused on maximi maximizing capital gains, but also the project was regarded by, by the institution's authorities as an opportunity to experiment when, with previously unexplored planning models and land management mechanisms. Sorry, then that first stage that implies the shift. Uh, for that, the university formed a multidisciplinary work team made up of professor at professors, administrative staff from the university campus, and some external experts, like my case. I was hired by the university as external expert, even though I have some relation as a lecturer in the university. I, I in integrate the work team that was established to conduct the project. Then this team oversaw the re-engineering of the project, its approach to th toward, an, toward an interaction with the surrounding community and the process of consultation and agreement with public authorities. This first uh, stage tries to uh, just to know what happened in the area. Who are the residents? What are their expectations? How to, how to establish means of common uh, construction of the urban renewal project. There was a whole effort to include and to consultate how to uh, add the residents' point of view about the project. Even though it was that first phase was characterized by high levels of distrust and antipathy, antipathy on the part of many stakeholders from the resident community who repeatedly expressed their lack of faith in the university on the grounds that the original proposals, the one before, had in the immediate past being carried out with no consultation or negotiation. In this part of the project, the community did not act in an organized or centralized way and had no single spokesperson or representative structure. It was 
different leading leaders that were emerging within the process. Then, even though the promoter thought that its construction of the of the proposals had been very inclusive, had a great effort of consultation, it was not the impression of a very important sector of the community. They react to the feasibility of the project. The city issued a special act that says the project is feasible and it will be approved at the end. And it creates a great reaction. Uh, up to this point, the political organization amongst the inhabitants of the zone had been incipient, as I already mentioned, but this same circumstance led to the strengthening of the two principal civic organization, a organization, sorry. The Don't Take Over Las Aguas Committee and the Community of the Houses, two main organizations that try to organize the community. Those grassroots manifest themselves in two different ways. On the one hand, they engage in several forms of, forms of informal civic protests, such as regular discussions, plan, panels and forums, social media activism and protests and rallies. On the other hand, the civic organization represented, represented the community on a formally instituted negotiation table that was promoted both, both by the university and the local government. As a result of that reaction, the city and the promoter decide to open a new stage of consultation and negotiation. The installation of the negotiation table was a direct product of the collective manifestations of this agreement, but by residents' community. After, two, after five months of negotiations, several agreements were reached on almost every matter of discussion. This ranged from the explicit commitment of the city and the fund of the promoter to ensure community participation and a budget for the investment that has to be made in public spaces, urban facilities, and social programs, to the definition of specific rules for partnering landowners with the project and for the relocation of original residents. Most issues of discussions were explicitly included in the formal administrative act of adoption of the instrument that governed, that adopted finally the project, which is a partial plan, plan partial in, in, the, in the same logic of the Spanish tradition. Finally, we have, uh, and I'm finishing because I know I'm taking more time than I was allowed to, but one more minute and I will finish. And after that, based on the definitions or the definitions of that negotiation that were included in the planning, uh, in, in the planning uh, instrument, the university as a promoter continued the process of dialogue and information sharing with the community, as well as dialogue with other stakeholders of City Hall in order to initiate the implementation phase. This implementation phase has to do with the final agreement of the landowners to contribute their land to the urban renewal project through a trust scheme that was spe specially designed to allow them to be part of the uh, urban renewal project. What can we learn about this, this process? First, the Phoenicia case shows that conflict resulted in changes of the process of the, of the spatial transformation of the environment, of the governance structure of the project, and of the procedures and practice in urban renewal process on a serious scale. This case informed some of the most inclusive and progressive uh, uh, local legislations that the city has issued recently. Based on this experience, the city has uh, scaled up the uh, results. The case, of course, has some particularities regarding the political context and the nature of the stakeholders. First, the implementation of the project occurs, as I mentioned, 
in the context of a crisis of, of urban renewal in the city and a widespread, widespread rejection of similar projects. The promoter, uh, Los Andes University, attempts to distance itself from the approach of market-driven urban redevelopment. The case shows that the existence of grassroots organization is not a prerequisite, a prerequisite for the implementation of a land readjustment scheme, but rather that its implementation can incentivize the creation of the creation of such of such organizations. If the land readjustment uh, literature is commonly to find that one of the things that you have to count to advance a uh, land re readjustment uh, project is to have already a well recognized and organized uh, civil organization. This project shows that maybe that's not a prerequisite. The employed mechanisms for the associations of the landowners with nowadays are associating with the project to facilitate the urban renewal clearly are not sufficient to include, and it has to be said, than other type of residents like Le like like leaseholders, for example, doesn't have the, or don't have the same guarantees and the same means to be included in the project. Then, even though this is a a, a mechanism that it's a, that it, that 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 it's established to ease the way of landowners can contribute their land to the project. It's also true that it's not that easy to include some other type of residents. That's it, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, thank you very much, uh, Juan Felipe. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. <laughs> um, in Colombia, they used to say, Cubo, uh, pues, no, en Medellín. Así que muchos recuerdos para Bogotá también. El, OK. Okay, well, uh, um, we are uh, in the last part of our seminar, and now I think that in my case, no, after introducing Anthony, co-founder of the Democratic Society, and Luis, professor of architecture, I now have the, uh, the honor of introducing Rebecca Lesbzinki from Australia. Participation, as we all know, requires taking into consideration all citizens, all interests, all needs, including new technologies. As it is, it's a key part of our society. We live in a digital society. And participation process has to take into account new technologies. And Rebecca is a very relevant expert in this field. Thank you very much for joining us, Rebecca. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me, and thank you to Marta, of course, also. So I've just I don't have many I don't have many slides, only a few, and they're not high tech. For a moment, I'm just going to share. Okay. Can you can you see the slides? No, not yet, not yet. I cannot see the slides. One second. Uh, okay. Try. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. All right. Sorry. Okay. Or if I okay, it. Yeah. okay, great. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, we, so I'm from uh, RMIT in Melbourne. Um, we, uh, it's the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University. We also have a campus in Barcelona, believe it or not. Um, and Marit has actually come to our, our campus a few years ago where we had a, a blockchain uh, conference. So a couple of years ago, um, we were very excited about blockchain, okay? And we still are very excited about blockchain, but uh, we were very, very excited, okay? Um, and I guess, I guess in some ways it was a little bit 
in, in those days, a few, well, it was like three years ago, we really had very, very high aspirations. And, and, and I guess in some ways maybe, I don't know, who knows, maybe if COVID hadn't happened, you know, who knows what would have happened, right? But the, the reality is that technology has really leapt forward very, very quickly because of COVID. So, but anyway, I want to talk a little bit about um, blockchain for property and planning in Australia, some predictions in relation, I guess, to public participation, all right? And also land registration. Okay, I'm going to ch hopefully change the slide. Okay, now in relation to Australia, um, I don't I don't know if you know much about land law in Australia. Uh, certainly, we were our, we are a common law jurisdiction, um, and we uh, which means we inherited uh, the English system, the British system, but we've also developed our own system. So we don't have we're not we're not a British land law system. We're something a little bit different. Um, what we have got is um, an excellent land registration system, which came in the 1860s. And in many ways, you could say it is an original blockchain. And I say that because what the way it used to work, it's being digitized now, is you would have um, a title, um, which always stayed um, at the land registry. And then you had a duplicate title, which of course went to the bank or to you, depending, depending if it was a mortgage, all right? And these both were mirrors, okay? So in many ways, um, it's a, a blockchain kind of scenario. And it, and it continues to work and it's, um, we have had very few cases of fraud um, and I don't think it's ever gonna change, I really don't. However, um, I mean, it's certainly not gonna be replaced immediately or in, even in the near future with a blockchain, with blockchain technology. So whereas three years ago, people were very excited about land registration and blockchain being a, a panacea, I don't know if it's, that's really gonna happen in Australia. There, has been, there have been in, in, in some instances, some instruments which have been trialed, uh, such as restrictive covenants uh, in, with blockchain technology in some of the states, New South Wales in particular. So I don't think there's a, a real strong future for blockchain for land registration at the moment, okay, in Australia. Now, in relation to planning permits, I can actually see a, a real possibility, possibility, particularly in terms of providence. By the way, I'm not going through to explain what blockchain is because I think three years on, everyone understands a bit about blockchain, all right? I don't think blockchain is, a, is a, a new, certainly not a new concept for people. But if it is afterwards in, in our discussion, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and also because Marta told me I only had a few minutes to, to, to present. Um, so in terms of planning permits, um, in terms of having a history, history of, the, of the different permits that will apply for um, uses uh, for parcels of land, I think, I think there's a really um, some, some strong uh, possibilities, but, but at the moment, nothing's being implemented. I think with the, the pandemic, a lot of projects that were sort of being thought about were put on hold. I mean, we were we in my in my city, Melbourne. You probably know we were in 109 days of lockdown last year. Um, not much has happened, okay. And I think things have sort of been quite slow in like, in this whole field of inquiry. Um, same, well, for, for building subdivisions. So for tower buildings, for example, um, you know, uh, BIM is being used. Not probably not as much as it could be used whether it, blockchain will replace BIM technologies and even old building management systems, I don't think it's gonna happen so quickly either, all right? But where I do think there is great opportunity for blockchain, in, particularly in relation to public participation, I think it's for, for condominium governance. And I know that uh, Spain is the leader in condo tech. I know that because I've met a guy from Alicante Recently, he told me that he's he's the leader. Uh, Pepe, Pepe, are you here, Pepe? Do you know Pepe, Marta? Anyway, he's a real expert on condo tech. Um, so he he's probably knows more about it than me. But I think, and I think it could very well come soon to Australia, is through, through all the, the governance side of tower buildings in relation to actual meetings, the you know, the minutes from meetings and also maintenance plans and then future planning for the building and so forth. I think there is a real um, um, opportunity for blockchain um, as a record keeping, uh, as, a, uh, as a record keeping that could be used also 
um, uh, for insurance purposes to show um, um, that um, you know the building is being upheld and the true providence of the building, but certainly in terms of actually including people in and decision making and so forth like, uh, as a sort of helping the decision making, I think that there is a huge possibility. Um, also, perhaps um, in relation to we've got a new model of build to rent developments um, coming into Australia, which which is something we hadn't had we hadn't really had before. I know that the you know, the states and, and Canada um, are, are big on that. We we have REITs, we do have REITs, but we haven't had this build to rent, uh, you know, a huge building is, is built and it's not privately owned. It's, well, it's owned by a conglomerate and the conglomerate um, only rents out a, a, a apartments. So I think there, um, again, with complaints and maintenance and, again, um, the governance side, it could, blockchain definitely has got um, great potential. So. That's where I think where I think it's going to be um, used a, a lot more, and I think there's huge um, um, opportunity, particularly for getting people involved in um, running meetings and, and 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 people you know people talking to each other and keeping really good records because that's I don't know what it's like in in European countries, but certainly one of the biggest faults in in, our, in Australia, and I would imagine also probably you know in North America. Is not proper record keeping for um, for complaints, meetings, maintenance in tower buildings, and so you know at the end uh, it's the people, the owners, and the residents who you know they they um, are impacted by this. Okay, um, again, I think you know it's still theoretical, and we're we're doing some research now, are starting to think about this, but. You know, we don't have the regulation for blockchain. Um, we still don't have a, a normalization. People know what a blockchain is and, you know, they, they, they're getting, you know, when I speak to people, they're getting a bit more savvy and understanding about um, how digital records can be uh, made permanent. However, you know, it's still very much, uh, like a, you know, theoretical thinking. Um, and also the cost that would be involved and particularly changing systems. I mean, it's just easy to run a meeting and just type notes um, rather than, you know, have this fancy technology to, 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 uh, to take over. I think also when smart contracts do come into law, and they will, of course they will. Uh, some jurisdictions already are dealing with smart contracts uh, being regulated. We are not in Australia. It's still early days but it's going to come. In fact, by now, there was already, there was, if things had gone the way they did, not just because of COVID, generally, uh, it was proposed that by now, the Australian stock, is, stock exchange was going to be run on a type of blockchain, but that's been put, that's been delayed for many years now. So I guess, I guess it's all about sort of acceptance and normalization. And I feel it's gonna come and I think there's great opportunity uh, for public participation with blockchain in the planning sphere and also I think in property, but particularly with condominiums. We, we started to uh, think a bit more about this and here is a link. I'm not sure if the link's gonna work, but anyway, here is a link. I'm not sure if we can put it up somehow. A link to a special issue we did for the Journal of Property Planning and Environment Law on um, uh, land uh, and environmental issues um, with blockchain. One of the sort of big I mean, it, it, it was published last year, but one of the big messages that came out is that we've, when it comes to land issue issues, we're still in a, what's called pilotitis, lots of pilots, um, but nothing, nothing's really tangible yet. So it's early days, but I feel that it's a great um, opportunity. And perhaps, Marta, when we do meet at our next blockchain face-to-face -face meeting, don't know where that's going to be, I haven't had my vaccination yet because we don't have vaccinations in Australia really yet. Um, then we'll be able to talk a little bit more about where, how it's being implemented with public participation. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, stop sharing the screen, yeah? Questions, how do you do that? Oops. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. I think that we are now at the end of, of our, our seminar, no? And, and in this sense, uh, I want to say thank you, as always, no? To the five speakers for the contribution. Now, to end the seminar, to summarize that, yeah, I think uh, I want to propose you to, to summarize in two minutes the best contribution for participation that you can share with us based on your own experience, no? I think you have two minutes each to, to summarize what is the best contribution, the best advantages or the, the, the best idea that you can share with all of us thinking about best practices in participation. And in this sense, the first of our speaker was Anthony. 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 Okay. Anthony, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, trying to summarize the best in two minutes is a, is a bit of a challenge, but I will I will do my best. Um, I think the the things that I would um, I would bring to the table are first um, the the sense of opening up to new possibilities that participation brings. I think there's sometimes an assumption that people have that to get a group of people together and to, part and to make them participate will end up at the kind of midpoint of their opinions. But, you know, there's like a, a single line and people are distributed along the line. And if they have a discussion, they end up in the middle. Actually, we find quite frequently that they end up in, in very different places. Sometimes they're much more radical than you expect. Sometimes they bring in very different perspectives. And in particular, we've seen in the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland, but also in Scotland and in some of the other processes that we've run, that people are much more willing to embrace a radical suggestion when it seems to come from the experience of your real lives or real people or from the people that they're talking to in the room. So, for example, it's a very small example, but a significant one. We did a piece of work in a, in a place called Romsey, which is in southern England. And I'm sure most people listening to this have never been to Romsey, but it is a very traditional, slightly conservative English small town. Uh, and like many slightly conservative traditional English small towns, there was a lot of car parking in the centre. And we were talking to them about a new town plan. And one of the things that came out of the recommendations was they actually wanted to get rid of lots of the car parking. Now, I'm absolutely certain that no politician in Romsey Town Council would have thought that the citizens of Romsey wanted less car parking because they are, you know, listening to the people that they listen to. But actually, when people came together and looked at the alternatives and looked at the options, that was where they ended up. And that kind of uh, surprising sometimes, challenging sometimes, radicalism from these kind of processes is a real demonstration of how bringing those different views together sometimes ends up with an inc uh, with uh, something entirely new coming out. And I think the other great thing about participation that I'd like to bring, it comes up from a couple of the things that we've, we've heard over the course of those excellent presentations just now. Um, but it's really about the impact that it has on participants. You know, to, to pa participation is a two-way thing. You know, citizens aren't, aren't like a sort of natural resource that you can go and mine and you take a certain number of them and then you leave the rest. You know, to, to do any of these kind of activities is to change the people who are participating as well. And hopefully it changes them in ways that decrease their anxiety or decrease their level of distrust and leave them feeling like they can get more involved. And we've seen, you know, now it's been several years since some of our earliest pieces of work, we've seen people who have, who started just by getting involved in something that we did five or 10 years ago, now taking senior roles in government or local government, or really being activists in much more, you know, much more um, busy, much more connected than they would otherwise have been, because they'd seen the impact that some of these methods can have and some of these participation approaches can have. So for me, it's about uh, participation as a way of finding the surprising consensus, not just the middle point, and also participation as something that changes the participants. It doesn't just change policy. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much. And uh, now, Camille, the floor is yours. Two minutes. Thank you very much, Antonio. Um, a few words about, uh, we talked about frustration, and Matt uh, talked again about frustration. Uh, I think um, frustration is not always uh, a bad outcome. It may be a positive outcome of participation. I mean, uh, that uh, people uh, involved in a participation process, if they are frustrated, 
it may generate more and more participation. And um, I think that in the French example of uh, the French Citizen Convention, the problem is the level of participation at the state level is a little bit too high. Uh, I think that the city or neighborhood uh, level may be the good level to participate and to involve uh, citizens in the decision making. Um, I think that at the neighborhood uh, level, um, I mean, citizen initiative is very important. This morning, I had a coffee with friends of my neighborhood, and there is a, a car park uh, very close to my, uh, to my um, apartment and of several uh, levels. And the upper level, uh, from the upper level, you have a wonderful view uh, uh, on Paris. And um, as many people uh, in my neighborhood are abandoning their car because we live in the center of Paris and you don't need car, no? you, need, you need bicycles. Uh, there is a huge page, uh, space sorry, to, uh, to occupy. And we are a few uh, friends uh, thinking about uh, to convert it uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, it's in a farm or a park. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is typically um, a private or citizen initiative that may um, uh, be a good idea to develop uh, citizen participation at the neighborhood uh, level. Uh, it's only an example, but um, I'm convinced and that why, uh, that's why I, I wrote this book on the, the city facing climate change. I think that this is the right level. This is the level of our major, major emission of uh, greenhouse gas. And this is also uh, the level to act, um, to act as citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Camille. Now is the, the floor is for Luis, Luis, our Spanish uh, participant. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Well, well, from our experience in Sierra Leone, as I mentioned, uh, we consider key the role of the universities, also connecting people, public institutions, private NGOs, the participation in different scales, to connect different scales, maybe to highlight, the, uh, as Camille mentioned, the importance of the neighborhood level, the neighborhood scale, and maybe the importance of connecting participation with the implementation of real actions for the citizens to understand that participating is more than just giving opinions, just to see maybe small actions that can be implemented in, in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now the floor is for uh, Juan Felipe from Bogota. Thank you, Antonio. <coughs> I would like just to insist in, in facing participation as no way to try to hide or avoid conflict, but to give a space for conflict to, to arise and to be on the, on the table. I think sometimes like the typical bureaucratic means of participation try to hide the imminent conflicts that are, that are very common in territorial approaches and in, in urban projects and urban initiatives and, and so on. Then I think that participation is, has to be seen as a mean for bringing the conflict and dealing with the conflict and just trying to find ways of dialogue through the conflict and finding balances that produce conditions of governance through conflict. I think that, especially in the, in the neighborhood level, let's say, in which there are many that you can find many tensions within the people who interact in a process like, for example, 
an urban renewal project that the one I, I explained. Uh, it's very important to, uh, let's say, uh, overcome the participation just to, as, as the previous speaker said, as just giving opinions is like bringing, bringing things to the table and proposing ways of exchange, ways of defining uh, rights and duties. And I think something much more, uh, much more uh, profound than the simply opinion. And I think just to finish that, once you find that maybe what you have to do through participation is to find how to get consensus and not having the consensus in the middle point, as it was already mentioned, but finding the consensus where it can be reached, not where you, your preconception says it has to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now we have two minutes for our last speaker, Rebecca, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I guess um, something that we're thinking about now, again, it's in relation to tower buildings and, and, and so very tall buildings that have their own communities. Um, the use of these technologies and new technologies, and I guess the word for me is sort of hopefully more inclusiveness, giving up a greater opportunity for people who perhaps could not have attended meetings before um, but also we have, a, we have a situation here in Melbourne where it's only the owners of the apartments that have any rights. The tenants, the renters, have no, right, have no say in the running of the building. Um, and I'm hoping that with, these, with the use of new technologies, blockchain and also even things like Zoom um, will, allow, will open up the opportunity of, to give a voice, an inclusive voice uh, to uh, renters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Okay, uh, now after all these uh, nice conclusions that all our panelists have done, I want to thank them uh, once again for your participation. I think that and just uh, wrapping up and for closing the session, uh, we have done an exercise, an intellectual exercise that has shown uh, a kaleidoscopical view of public participation. And, you know, you see a kaleidoscope, when we see only one color, if we talk about Africa or France or Europe, we, we will see just that color. And what we have offered, and it was the purpose of this session, it's just to move this uh, kaleidoscope. And the beautiness of uh, this vision is far more uh, richer and deep than any one of our visions. And in this sense, I think this is the exercise of what public participation is and what public participation should be. So that uh, we are deep involved in these processes. And many words, and I finish with all this also mosaic of words, uh, very strength words that we have talked about, like trust, connection, complementary, strengthen, convection, convention, unfiltered connections, conflicts of media of resolution, gaps, filling these gaps, scales, the good scale, the local scale, involvement, governments, digitalization that connects and control, and at last everything that ends in people involvement. I think with these kaleidoscopic words, we can finish. And I really thank you so much for this Open Government Week and this experience, global experience all around the world with digitalization. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you.
See, see you soon in Madrid. Yeah. <laughs> we can't wait. We can't wait. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.